Hey folks, in this interview, it's all about architectural photography with Jim Doyle. This is Twitter. Hey, welcome back to another episode of This Week in Photo. Today I'm sitting down with Jim Doyle. He's an architectural photographer and educator based in Southern California. We're going to be diving deep into the business side of architectural photography and sort of demystifying some of the misconceptions about the ease of entry into the business and how some of the more successful people that are that are operating in that space, like Jim, how do they operate their businesses and how do they stave off competition? So Jim Doyle, welcome to This Week in Photo, man. How you doing? Pretty good, pretty good. Thanks for having me. No, thank you for coming on. I've been looking forward to this to this conversation. So, um, you know, let's let's just start from the the, the beginning. I want to get a little bit of a, a an introduction to Jim Doyle and sort of how you got to be to where you are now, business wise, and then we'll dive into the nitty gritty of the business. So, who who is Jim Doyle? When you know your your elevator cocktail party speech. Uh. I'm a guy who makes things, uh, uh, I photograph things that I don't have to make smile. Let's put it that way. <laughs> there you go. See, that is perfect. That is, that is the, the perfect thing. You know, like we, that could be landscape photography as well, though, right? So. That could be pretty much any kind of uh, photography where you don't have a live subject. That's correct. Yeah. That's correct. Yeah. Well, this is, good. this is cool. But, the, you know, you and I, we did that, that pre-interview and we were talking about just sort of the direction that we would take this interview. And it became clear that, you know, I've done, you know, I've done a couple of other interviews with real estate photographers and architectural photographers. Um, and what we fail to discuss in detail is just the business side of how all that stuff works. Like, how do you get clients? What's the best way to get clients and that sort of thing? So I wanted to talk to you about that. Like the, and I wanted to start it off with the importance of having a business plan, you know, and some people say, especially, you know, in today's sort of entrepreneurial world, business plan, you know, whatever, like Elon Musk doesn't have a business plan. Why should I have one? Is it important to have a business plan for this kind of business or should you just be winging it and knocking on doors to get clients? Well, let me let's re ask the question a different way. If you were going on a road trip, would you have a destination in mind and a map on how to get there? Yeah. GPS counts as a map. Um, any business needs a roadmap of some kind. You set a destination or a goal in mind, and you have to have a map or business plan or some kind of details on how to get there. Otherwise, it's just a hobby. Yeah, yeah. Remember, remember at the end of the day, if you choose to make a business of photography, it's a business. It just so happens you make pretty pictures for a living and get paid to do it. If you treat it like a business, it takes care of you like a business. And at the thing that, that never ceases to amaze me is that people will pay good money for what someone creates if they believe and trust the photographer. Yeah. But how do you, how do you get to that point though? You know, like, like I said, the whole, the, the art of creating a business plan and then, you know, taking that into the bank to get your business loan and all that stuff. It seems like those days are behind us for the most part. So if someone wants to put a plan in place or that map, like you're saying, how do they do that? Do they just scratch out some ideas on a piece of paper in pencil or is it something more formal that, that you're talking about? Well, when I was in school, they taught us that you had to create a business plan that was about 30 to 40 pages long. And, um, you know, I've gotten to the point where we change our plan about we review it every six months and we we update it every year um, because you have to kind of reinvent yourself every year. But there's basically 10 steps that uh, that I look at and my team looks at. We define what kind of photography we want to do. So do you want to photograph kids? Do you want to photograph families? Do you want to photograph products, automobiles, um, architecture, real estate, whatever? Then the second thing is you have to define uh, what you want to sell. What is it you want to sell? Just the digital images, prints, your product. Create your marketing materials around that so you attract a particular client. So if you're talking to uh, uh, families about photographing their family and their babies, you're not going to show them real estate photography. You're going to show them uh, family portraiture. Yeah. 
Yeah. Same thing with uh, real estate. If you're going to show resale real estate, you use those kind of photos. Architecture for home builders is a different kind of photography. And commercial photography, commercial builders don't want to see model homes. They yeah. want to see they want to see commercial buildings. In that, so, no, keep going, keep going. So your company name, your logo, um, your website, your business card, your pricing, your contracts, and don't worry about defining at all. Define enough so that you can get that first client. Everything will come in due time. But be sure to define your sales presentation and your 15 second elevator pitch. The elevator pitch is really critical, like you just caught me off guard. Uh, (laughs) uh, Basically, when you meet somebody and they ask you what you do, you need to be able to say something that asks them, tell me, or they ask you, tell me more. Mm -hmm. Number four is define who your ideal customer is. Who is it you want to photograph? Um, it becomes very evident what kind of material you're going to need to market that once you define who your client is. Go put yourself in front of those kind of clients. Where do they hang out? Where do real estate agents hang out? Where do families with kids hang out? Where do, and go find a hundred no's. You'll find one or two yeses in that. I learned that back in the 70s with a a class uh, on strategic selling that I took from IBM. And they tell you, go get 100 no's. You'll find one or two yeses. Yeah. Yeah. Number seven is produce your product. Number eight, define, deliver the product. Number nine is collect the money. And number 10 is ask for referrals. It's that simple. That's the process. And you just need to use it over and over again. It sounds pretty simple, defining, but defining each step can be pretty overwhelming sometimes. But remember, you don't have to have all the answers to start. Just get started. Um, you know, what do you have to lose? Yeah, yeah. And a, and a lot of people, you know, they, they suffer from that, uh, you know, myself included on a lot of things. And that's analysis paralysis, right? <laughs> you, you get excited about something or, you know, maybe even watch just this interview with you. I'm like, oh, man, that's awesome. I want to dive into that that genre of photography. I feel like that might be my calling. Um, and then you overthink it. Like, well, you know, I want to be like Jim, but I got to buy everything that Jim has. And I got to move to Southern California and I got to do this. And I got, you know, so therefore, you know, I'm just going to keep doing what I'm doing for a while and not jump in. What advice do you give to those people that are they want to they they hear you and they're like, yeah, the most important thing is to start, of course, but it's hard to get off the couch. It's hard to break that routine of, you know, it's Tuesday night. My favorite show's on and then dinner and then this and then that. And then Wednesday comes and I, you know, I'm pre-programmed to do all this other stuff. How do you break out of it to do something as great as what you're doing? Well, my suggestion is stay there. Let me take care of the work for you. <laughs> um, Let me make you know, the money. <laughs> you know, uh, uh, there's a gentleman that I know up in the Bay Area who um, asked me to come up to do a seminar a few months ago. And uh, he's a pet photographer. Mm-hmm. And so he was asking me a very uh, the, the same question. How did you do it? How did it? And, and, you know, I said to him, his name was Jim. Also, I said, Jim, it's real simple. I said, explain to me what you're doing. And he described his process. And his process is exactly the same as what I just described. Mm -hmm. He defined what he was, what his, who his client was. He defined what it was he was delivering. He defined his shooting process. He defined how he was going to deliver it. He just needed to, he needed to do more of it. Yeah. That's all. So can somebody do this on a, when they have a nine to five job? Yes. Is it easy? No. Right. But you have to. You know, you have to jump and the net will appear is a saying that we employ. Jump and the net will appear. I like uh, that. I like that. Okay. In one of my seminars that, I, that I, I teach, we go into more detail and all this kind of stuff, the 10 steps, and we actually help photographers define their businesses and find clients that they can work with. Um, I have four rules in business and, you know, I have to like the client, the client has to like me, they have to like my work and they have to pay me on time. Yeah. And uh, those four have have uh, have worked really well for us. So. That's, that's how you build a, a successful business relationship in this stuff. You know, I want to rewind a little bit. Um, and you mentioned when you were talking earlier about um, your team and you mm-hmm. you've put together a team to help with this stuff. And a lot of us are you know, solopreneurs, especially in the creative space. We're like, you know what? I can do all this by myself. I got, 
you know, I got sites for or services for websites, accounting. I can do all that stuff. I can market myself. I got an email list over here. I got my camera. I'm a one man band and I can do it. What do you say to that? Because you're not a one man band. You you're an orchestra. You know, how did, <laughs> how did you make the leap from one man band to, to uh, orchestra? Good question. Um, that decision is completely up to the individual. If you want to stay small, then stay small. The advantage is you can control every aspect of your business and work on work when you choose to work. The big difference, if you want to grow your business is growing your business means you get to focus on things that you're really good at and delegate things that don't generate income for you. Mm -hmm. Think about it. Um, you make money every time you press the shutter button. Why would you not be out pressing the shutter button? You don't make money when you're doing the accounting and making deliveries and running errands. So you, there's a rule in business that says delegate or stagnate. Um, I chose to grow mine. And, and the reason was so that I could focus on the t two things that I do well, and that's working with clients and improving my photography skills. That's, that's just the passion that I have. Uh, I defined a style of photography. I worked with my clients to establish looks and angles that they want. And then I found like-minded people who I can work with to, uh, that are photographers and editors who work with us to, on the, the different processes. And now we all have an income that, and we're not dependent on one person um, for an income. So if one of my guys gets sick, I'm not worried about where the paycheck's going to come from next week. Yeah. And I get to work on my business rather than in my business. Um, I get to go out, uh, work with new, find new clients, uh, develop new lighting styles, evaluating new equipment opportunities. Uh, on rather than in so yeah i've heard that i've heard that work on the business versus working in the business i think that was in that book uh, i don't know if you read it it's called rich dad poor dad you ever mm -hmm. read that one yeah i think they talk about the idea of the mindset of the rich you know or people that are that are generating income that's more than the outflow, right? <laughs> so the definition right. of rich. And part of that is when you're when you're an entrepreneur is to do exactly what you said, is to work on your business instead of being a slave to it and working inside of it. Um, but speaking of working, so there's the the idea of clients. And I, this is this is a great interview for me because I can approach it from a complete outsider standpoint. I've never done this genre of photography, let alone run a business in it. And when I think about it, in, in the other interviews I've done on this topic, I think about the idea of client acquisition as, okay, if it's, if it's real estate photography or architectural photography, I need to go find some for sale by owner signs and go knock on the door or go to an agent and find a popular agent and ask them, you know, yeah, can I, can I be your photographer or, or things like that? Otherwise pounding the pavement, you take a, you take a, I was going to say a slightly different approach. You take a, a widely different approach to it that, when, that, that I learned about in our pre-interview that it's so much smarter than that. Can you describe, <laughs> can you describe yeah. your technique and, and what you, what you do versus pounding on doors? I go find a hundred no's. Yeah. There's no, there's no secret. There's no secret. It's it. You have to, you have to convince or you have to get people to trust you, um, in the, um, uh, in the process, mm -hmm. um, we've standardized. We we have specialized, I should say, not standardized. We've specialized. If you go to the doctor, you go to a GP. He's a jack all trades, okay. But if you got a problem with your eyes, he's going to send you to a specialist, or your ear, or your arm, or whatever. He's going to send you to a specialist. Why? Because those guys are the specialists. Yeah. Well, photography is very similar. You can be a jack of all trades, and that's great in small towns. But when you get into uh, larger marketplaces. And if you want to really grow and make a significant, turn it into a business where you can earn a living at it, uh, you really do need to specialize uh, in, in certain kinds of, of work. If you're, if you're in a market 
uh, it depends on the market and the photography. For instance, if you're, um, you know, do, do you get an agent? Do you do it yourself? Do you have salespeople, whatever? Wedding photographers, you know, they need coordinators to grow their business. They need to work with wedding coordinators. Fashion and commercial typically work through agents because they have ties into the big automakers or clothing manufacturers. Architecture, real estate, that's a different genre. Um, you're dealing with major corporations now, big companies, and they have marketing departments. They create a brand, a look, a style. Mm -hmm. Think about Coca-Cola. You know, that's a huge. Now that goes through an agency, which goes through agents. But if we go back into the real estate business, um, you know, a, a brokerage house might have 100 agents of which 25 to 30 are the top sellers. Well, those are the folks that you want to approach. Uh, and find a way to build a, a client base. So find a client who likes your work, who'll give you multiple shoot days per month or per year, and will pay you uh, pay you what you feel you're worth. And then uh, you know you you're you are where you need to be. That's how contracts or 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 business to business works. Um, there are several reasons why big companies change photographers. Uh, either they're changing their look and their feel and their brand, mm -hmm. or they're, they had a fallout with their current photographer. He wasn't available when they needed him, or they like you better and they like, uh, then they like their current photographer. And finally, price. Uh, price can be an issue, but usually it's not as much of a, of a, uh, an issue as the, uh, the other points you you have to do your homework and you have to find out where that sweet spot is for your product versus everybody else and where the market is. I am not the the, the least expensive uh, architectural photographer in the Southern California market, yeah. uh, but I'm definitely not the most expensive either. We found our niche and our sweet spot and uh, we do well doing what we do. Yeah. Remember, it, remember when you're in the process of creating a business or, or selling to uh, a client, it, and this is, goes across the board, doesn't matter what business you're in, remember at, as long as it takes for you to break into an account, it will take your competitor the same amount of time or longer if you do your job and deliver to the client what they need. There's a certain loyalty in big companies, so make them your friends. Yeah. Um, and then go out and find 10 more just like that. It's a numbers game like any business. But the, uh, the, the, the whole, the, what I want to understand is, uh, as well as that, is the price, you, you mentioned pricing and how you, you know, you, you, there can be high end and, and low end and, and sort of middle, middle ground there. From a layman's perspective, when I look at this kind of photography, and I want to have you sort of, before you go into that, I want to have you de define, so I'm not, I'm using the right terms. So there's, Real estate photography, I'm sort of using real estate photography and architectural photography interchangeably. Is that is that right? And you know, what's is there is there a difference between the, the, the genres of architectural photography and real estate photography, you know, from your perspective? Realistically, no. Yeah. Are there because because if you're photographing a a building a house it's it's architecture you're you're uh, documenting the architecture mm -hmm. is it different in terms of genre in terms of market yes um, real estate which is resale is one type of photography for MLS for things like that mm -hmm. uh, architecture new home builders commercial builders, that's a different genre because you're dealing with different people. Real estate um, wants to show, as a general rule, uh, four walls in a shot. They want to show the vast open space and how nice it is and how it looks. Yeah. Um, in architectural photography, when you move into, and, it, and it's not that one's better than the other because I know a lot of guys who make good money at, at the real estate photography, but on the other side, when you move into the, the higher, end, um, higher end architectural photography, uh, where we're not putting out 30 shots an hour, we're putting out maybe six to 10 shots a day, you're dealing with architects, you're dealing with developers, you're dealing with builders, you're dealing with interior designers, and each of these need to be photographed a little bit differently. Architects are looking for details. Builders, developers are, uh, developers are looking for the overall view. 
Builders are looking for the fit and finish. Designers, it's the decor. Yeah. So you have to plan for that and be aware of that in each. Real estate photography, you're showing the four walls and the livability. The other ones, you know, it, it, it changes the program. So if you're dealing with a builder, you have to photograph things one way. If you're dealing with a designer, you're looking at things in a slightly different, uh, different fashion. Yeah. And then how does that affect pricing? So if you're in, again, layman's layman's perspective, architectural, it's more syllables. It must be more money, right? <laughs> so, <laughs> is architectural more expensive than real estate photography or do I have it, do I have it backwards? Well, um, there's a, there's a lot of trends, a lot of changes going on in the, in the, uh, obviously constantly going on in the photographic world. Um, MLS, uh, Photography tends to be the uh, least, uh, how do I put it? Uh, it's more commoditized, right? It's, it's commo very much commoditized, yeah. yes. Yeah. So, so a little less per job. Uh, when, you, when you start, but think about it, you don't get anywhere near this, the amount of equipment to get started in that. Yeah. Uh, if you move into the higher end architectural photography where you're photographing a 10,000 square foot house, and one of the rooms is 1,500 square feet, you know, you need some light. Uh, and so the lighting equipment, the types of lenses that you use, uh, the number of lights, you know, we, we use anywhere from 10 to 40 lights on a particular, on a job. Yeah, it's, it's, it's a big deal. So, yeah. so, you know, one shot will take an hour to set up and to really stage properly and get it absolutely perfect, you know, whether it be the a symmetrical or whether it be the way the furniture looks because things don't, you're trying to create a three-dimensional view in a two-dimensional space, and so we have to make things look prospectively correct. Yeah. So, um, and then you go up from there, and and uh, you know, architectural. If you work for Architectural Digest, they get paid pretty good, yeah. and that. But you know, the genres are changing, and and the look and the feel and the style is changing. If you look at what was popular ten years ago. Uh, when the baby boomers were buying everything, uh, that's not what's being what's working now. You've got the next gen uh, that came in, and then you've got the millennials that came in, and now you got the Gen X coming behind that. And think about, you know, we use these things, and we've become accustomed to a lot of what can yep. be uh, be taken on this rather than on a on the new uh, 5D Mark IV from Canon or the 850 from Nikon or the Sony A7R III. So. Um, it, it's uh, it's it's different and uh, it's it's always changing. So this is another reason why I chose uh, when when I first started my business, it was just me. I was going to do, doing the selling and then I would shoot it and then I would process it. And that gave me one day to go back out and do some more selling. And then I would just keep that going. And then I got to the point where, hey, I need two days of work a week, two days of shooting. OK, now I'm working 60 hours a week. And now I need four days. Worth. <laughs> well, wait a minute. Now I got to delegate some of this stuff because I got to sleep. And yeah, yeah. Uh, and that's how that's how it progressed in my in my case. Um, I brought in somebody to help me with the post production. Um, then I brought in a, an accountant, another photographer who helped me, and we started growing it from there. So we're up to 14 people right now. Wow. And, it, and that and that's about growth and scale. That's just smart. Right. Because you're there's only so many hours in the day. And if you there's like, you know, if you want to make more money, you could create more hours in the day or or duplicate yourself by adding more people to the mix. So so you, you brought up a good a good question uh, about um just sort of the ease of use like you were mentioning the cell phone and how the the current generation arguably the previous one you know in future generations are becoming more and more accustomed to these highly capable cell phones and you know artificial intelligence and computational photography that all these things can do way beyond things that were happening when i grew up with film right you could do magic with your phone now sure. um which lowers kind of right the barrier to entry or at least the perceived barrier to entry to a genre like this if you're selling to a gen xer and they're like what well, i need to hire this guy for i gotta i have an iphone 20 you know and it can see into the future i'm gonna take to do my own photos how do you manage competition like that both from the side of ignorance of what it takes to live with 60 lights to get a beautiful shot and, and also from new photographers that are coming into the genre and undercutting you and saying, hey, 
I just got this, you know, this little mirrorless camera. I'm going to hang my shingle out and take business uh, away from Jim. How, how do you safeguard and, and make sure that your drawbridges are up so that you don't get invaded every day? <laughs> that's an interesting that's an interesting question well you never know the only way you know I have a team of people that that I have a couple of salespeople that uh, work with me they're they're account managers essentially and we stay close to our clients we we work with them we talk to them on a regular basis we meet with them we uh, go to their offices Sometimes it's as simple as an email, sometimes a phone call, sometimes it's in person. But uh, as long as the client trusts you and believes uh, in your ability uh, to, to understand their vision, um, you'll continue to business with that client. The other thing is most of my clients are, are pretty big companies and they got a volume that um, most photographers wouldn't be capable of handling. Um, yeah. That's, you know, if, if they had one, yes, but if they have five, uh, that's a problem. So, yeah. so that's another that's another uh, aspect of it. Um, I, I, you know, I, you talk about computational photography, and and I do a lot of R and D. I research. Uh, I've got one of the light uh, light dot co uh, computa computational cameras. Um, I'm, I, I test stuff to see how it might fit into our uh, our particular what we're doing and um, I'm constantly looking at new products evaluating them trying to you know figure out if it fits and will work and if it's a production tool that we can we can use to create the look and feel you know what lights do we use uh, you know how do we match color density and or color cast and things of that nature yeah. all of those things are things that you know that I have to work on on a regular basis the R&D of staying ahead and then we we make sure that we have um, we have the right product mix for the client. Uh, we have, you know, yeah, I'm an architectural photographer, but there are several other things that we do, products that we bring to the table for our clients. Uh, we invested in the Matterport uh, 3D uh, virtual tour camera yep. uh, because one of our clients asked us to do that. And now we have several clients that we we do that, um, those tours for. We don't that's not our primary market. That's a secondary product, but but it uh, it does generate a little bit of revenue and it keeps our clients happy and it gives them a product at a reasonable price. Um, Ariel and drone. I have two licensed and uh, uh, insured pilots on my staff. Um, I do the I line up the shot. They fly the drone because uh, you have to have two sets of eyes. You know, yeah. with all the. The rules associated. So all these little things are are things that that uh, we work on and to try and make sure that we're delivering to our client. But again, we stay specialized. We don't do video. We do stills. We don't do, you know, we don't do uh, um, uh, virtual reality from the standpoint of taking designs and um, uh, turning them into a a uh, like a three like D walkthrough kind of thing. Yeah, we don't we don't do that with with we do that with the, the Matterport camera because that's a uh, it's actual photograph, mm -hmm. but we don't we don't do that like with um, um, what's like, it, like uh, CAD or or yeah CAD drawings, things of that nature. We don't do that. There are, there are other folks that do that, and some clients want that. Yeah. Uh, our clients don't, and so we just try and find the clients that. Uh, that we can work with that work within our scope of expertise. We're specialists. We're not, we don't try to be, you know, I have a, I have a relationship with a photographer, another photographer who does all the portrait work for me because yeah, I can photograph people. No problem. I used to do it back in the day. Um, but I don't, uh, I don't do that anymore. And I bring in somebody who's really a specialist at, at that kind of stuff and can do a really good job for me. And my customers are happy with that and we move on. So, yeah, well, I want to wrap this up and I have a, a question about just how, how all this works in, in with, with fluctuations in the economy, right? Because we, we all know when we're in a recession or a depression or, the, the economy is otherwise not doing well. People buy fewer houses, which I would imagine affects you directly. How do you how do you stave off 
that the, you know those kinds of ups and downs are you like pack pack nuts away like a squirrel for the lean times and then, and then party when uh, when it's up and to the right you know how does that work you make hay when the sun shines bud <laughs> let me tell you <laughs> um we we work in the building industry so okay. so goes the building industry so goes my business uh, i'm a member of the appropriate organizations i attend meetings on a regular basis i uh, i look at market forecasts i follow national trends uh, this way i can see what's coming what's hot what's not what's being used in in other markets um, but at the end of the day, I stay close to my clients and we try to get forecasts from them as to what, what the market looks like. Yeah. Um, we're always looking for new clients, too. So we realize that at some point, you know, things are going to drop. Well, what, what, how do you fill in that hole? And we try to we try to budget. We try to budget our, our all of my people try to budget so that we know that um, we can live on three to four days worth of work a week, but we work five days a week so that if when it does get slow, you know, we have the ability to, to pull back a little bit and, uh, um, and survive. We survived the last downturn. Um, you know, we'll survive this one. So, yeah. Yeah. What, do, uh, what, uh, what's coming up next for you? Like what's, what's the next sort of thing that, that you've got your eye on to sort of drive the company towards? Well, we're working on uh, several new lighting styles and and uh, um, photographic styles. We have three styles now that our clients can choose from, and we're working on a couple of new ones. Uh, we're seeing a shift in market um, as the uh, baby boomers fall off and the next gen comes in and then the millennials and the gen X, everybody has a different view of what photography looks like. Take a look at architectural digest or Lux magazine, yeah. the, the changes that they've gone through in the last few years, uh, in the last five years has been phenomenal. Um, they're, they're now into a totally different genre. Uh, or style of photography that um, is becoming more and more popular in the hospitality industry the same way. We work in the hospitality industry too. Um, but we're, we're, we're constantly looking for new, new ways to create or to entice. Our, our job is to create a product that attracts clients that attracts people and uh, we've seen when when a client switches to our product we see an increase in the amount of traffic which translates into the number of people don't people don't go look at homes anymore just take a weekend and go tour homes people use the internet yeah. and so that that photograph has to set the hook and it has to get them to want to take the next step, which is get in their car at three fifty to five dollars a gallon and buy the gas to go drive twenty miles to go see the house. So whether it's a new home or a resale home or any kind of home or whatever, people want to see. You know, you're seeing a, a significant growth in the online ordering, and you're seeing a decrease in the brick and mortar. Well, the same thing is true in our in our. Um, our business. We, we've seen, we noticed this about five years ago and we really pushed hard in that direction and it's paid off for us. So. Love it. Love it. Very cool. I, I could talk to you for hours, man. <laughs> so much, so much to learn, but thankfully oh. you do seminars. You have a seminar series. Tell me about that and how that works and how people can sign up for that if they want to sort of put a toe in the water in this space. Well, I teach a class at Rancho Santiago College for uh, beginners uh, to try and get people interested in the art of photography. I think that it's important that we as uh, artists uh, pass on the passion to other people and get them excited about this art form because not everybody can paint or sculpt. Yeah. And uh, I cer cer certainly can't paint and I certainly can't draw, but I'm, I'm reasonably good behind the camera. Yeah. Um, we have, I, I work through the, uh, I belong to the Professional Photographers of America and uh, California and the Orange County, uh, PPOC, uh, which is Professional Photographers of Orange County. And we work out of the California Center for the Arts in Santa Ana. And I have seminars where I, um, I teach people um, the art of photography and how to 
how to how to see how to see and photograph architecture because yeah. at the end of the day it's all about perspective and it's all about the light yeah i love it i love it jim doyle thank you for coming on this week in photo man i, I appreciate it i will link to your your whatever you give me you know your seminars your website etc in the blog post and in the uh, the youtube video for this episode and thank you so much uh, man for coming on and sharing sharing the stuff that you know it's a pleasure. Thank you for having me. I enjoyed it very much. Okay. All right, man. Have Look a good forward day. to the next one. Later. Okay. Thanks. See ya. This is Twitter.